Hey church, I'm so glad that you are carving out some time uh, to hang with us. Let me invite you, if you haven't got a chance to be with us in person uh, at AMC 22, the Hoffman Theater in Alexandria, Virginia. We gather every Sunday at 8.30 and 10 a.m. and I wanna invite you to join us. There's nothing like being in the room where the Word, where God's Spirit and God's people gather together. It's not the same without you and we can't wait to see you soon. It was my cross you put so I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life is yours, and I will see of your goodness forevermore. Worthy is your name. Deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. shame is gone I stand amazed in your love undeniable Your grace goes on and on and I will see of your goodness forevermore Worthy is your name Your glory fills this place You alone deserve our praise You're the name above all names Be exalted now in the heavens As your glory fills this place You alone deserve our praise You're the name above all names Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place You alone deserve our praise You're the name above all names Be exalted now in the heavens As your glory fills this place You alone deserve our praise You're the name above all names Be exalted now in the heavens As your glory this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all names be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name
deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. At Hill City Church, we want you to know that every time you give is safe and secure, whether that's in person or online. I'm glad to be a part of such a generous church. Now grab your Bibles as we continue in the book of Mark. Hey church, so glad that you are carving out some time uh, to gather uh, together around God's word. Uh, we are in a sermon uh, series uh, called Crown and Cross, where we are looking uh, at the purpose and the identity of Jesus um, through the lens of Mark's gospel. And so we want to invite you uh, to join us right now. Uh, chapter 9, uh, Mark chapter 9, and we're going to begin at verse 2. Uh, and I hope you got your Bible. Uh, read along with me. It says, And after six days, Jesus took with them Peter and James and John, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And then Peter says to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we're here. Let us make tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He says, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus charged them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept this matter to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead might mean. And they, they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things and how it is written that the son of man should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you that Elijah has come and they did to him whatever they pleased as it was written of him. We'll stop there, bow our heads and our hearts for prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your word. It is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And God, I pray today that we would, in this moment, push back all the things we have to do later on, all the things that are vying for our attention and our focus. And now, Lord, we discipline our hearts and our minds to be attentive to you. Speak to us. We're listening. We're we're longing for your word. We're longing for your voice. So God, do that now. Wherever we find ourselves, speak to us. And then give us the courage to obey. Be formed in the image of your son, Jesus. And it's in that name that we pray and ask all of these things. And all God's people said, amen. Well, we've found ourselves now kind of moving into the second part of this sort of crown and cross last week when we talked about Jesus, uh, Jesus being confessed by Peter as the Messiah. When Peter makes that confession, it sort of is the pivotal moment. It's the change. It's the change in the story. It's the change in the narrative. And so now you begin to see Jesus really uh, sort of leaning into not just his identity, but now the purpose and wanting to make that clear and unfold that for his followers. So as soon as like Peter makes that confession, the focus changes. And so for us now, we'll begin to see Jesus consistently speaking of his death, speaking of his suffering. And to be honest, it's ways that it's in ways that the disciples find difficult to comprehend, to to swallow and to even sort of receive and accept. It's a hard word for them 
to grab hold of this idea that Jesus as king is not this conquering warrior, but Jesus as king is a suffering servant, is one who is submitting himself unto death so that through his life, death, and resurrection, we might have life and life to the full. Jesus is not just trying to come and set things right in that moment. He's not trying to deal with oppressive governmental systems. He's not trying to correct the order of of culture in that day. What Jesus is coming to do is to fulfill and to establish an eternal kingdom, an eternal reign. And this is what he is bringing on the scene. And so for us, when we look at this passage, we understand that, that Mark has been signaling sort of things throughout their their history. We know that Mark writes with this sort of speed. He writes with an immediately and then. And and there's almost that you're not quite sure the distance between one event and the other. It feels like it almost happens sort of in sequence. But Mark begins this passage, and he's very, very clear to tell us that there was a specific amount of days between when the confession out of Peter's mouth happens and now when this, when this moment upon the mountain um, takes place, that it is six days. So Mark wants the reader to be reminded and to understand that this passage should be read in light of and connecting, sort of comparing and contrasting between Exodus chapter 24 and Exodus 34, where, where Moses is meeting with God upon a mountain. And I, I want to give you a few sort of kind of comparing and contrasting between Jesus and this Moses Moses narrative. The first one, Jesus takes three disciples up on the mountain, Mark chapter 9, verse 2. When Moses goes with three named persons plus the 70 elders up the mountains, you see that in Exodus chapter 24, Jesus is transfigured and his clothes become radiantly white. We saw that in verse 2 and 3. Well, in Exodus chapter 34, when Moses ascends the mountain and he meets with God, Moses' skin is shining, it's glowing, it's radiating as he descends the mountain after talking with God. God appears in Mark chapter 9 verse 7 in a veiled form in an overshadowing cloud. And the same thing takes place in Exodus chapter 24, where God appears in a veiled form, overshadowing cloud cloud that covers Moses. A voice speaks from the cloud in in Mark's account. A voice speaks from the cloud in the Exodus account. The people are astonished when they see Jesus after he descends the mountain. And then in Moses' they're afraid to come near Moses after he, he descends the mountain. Mark wants you to see and hold these two narratives together. Not only is Moses kind of in the Mark narrative, as well as Elijah. But he wants you to see that Jesus ascends the mountain and he meets with God. But when he meets with God, it's not in the same way. That it's actually a fuller, it's a truer, it's a richer sort of encounter than what we even see in the Old Testament narratives. Mark wants it to be very, very clear to us that Jesus is not disconnected from Israel's past, from its history, and the work that God has been doing. Friend, I need you to hear that for your life and for mine as well. What is happening in your situation, what's happening in your family, what's happening in your personal life, what's happening in your world, is not disconnected from what God has been doing throughout history. So maybe you find yourself overwhelmed. Maybe you find yourself at a space where you have uncertainty. I just want you to know there's no need to be overwhelmed because the same God that has been faithful throughout the ages is the same God that is working in your story and in your situation right here and right now. He wants us to be certain that we see this connection. You see, Moses was unable to see God's glory directly. We we know from the scriptures that anyone that would be in the presence of God that was was not veiled, where there was not some sort of separation, 
that God's holiness was more intense than what humanity could could bear. It's why he tells Moses at one point where Moses says, I want you to show me your glory. In other words, I want to feel the weight of your presence. I want to feel, I want to know, I want to see your glory. I don't want to just hear about it. I want to experience it. And God, God says to Moses, you can't experience that and live. You can't bear the weight of that and continue to exist. So he hides him in a rock and he says, I'm going to let my glory pass in front of you. And when my glory passes in front of you, when I pass, you're going you're gonna to see the, the trail. I, I've heard it described this way. If you've ever seen, whether on a movie or in real life, you've seen a vehicle, maybe it's a, a, an old model truck on a dirt road, and it's just kind of, man, it's hauling, and it's going down that dirt road. What will happen is that vehicle is going to kick up dust. There's going to be this sort of trail behind it. When God passes in front of Moses, what he shows him and what he, what he lets Moses see is what's taking place, like what the, the after effect. And this is what leaves Moses in this space of radiation. He's not encountering the full presence and glory. And yet it impacts him in such a way, it transforms him. You see, we're, we're supposed to see this narrative of Moses as something that's going to speak to what's taking place in this passage here in Mark. There's a term for that, and the term is typology. Typology assumes that God's prior redemptive acts that are recorded in the scriptures, that they are kind of a, a foreshadowing of later events, or they're going to be used to speak and give direct insight into those. And so Moses wasn't able to see God's glory directly, but even getting near, even getting near God's glory was enough to make Moses' face radiate. But then when Jesus is in that moment, he transfigures. His entire, his entire being changes in that moment. It's not just his face as the after effect. What we are seeing in that space and in that moment is that Jesus before them is pulling back the curtain He's sort of tearing the veil, if you will, for them to see who he is. Peter confesses that he's Christ, and now Peter, standing there with two other disciples, sees clearly with his eyes what his spirit had perceived six days previous, that you are the Messiah. And Jesus reveals himself to them in a profound way that attaches the work of God in the present to the work that God had been doing. Moses and Elijah are critical figures throughout the history of the the people of Israel. Moses, the lawgiver. Elijah, arguably the most powerful prophet in all of the Old Testament. You have the law, you have the prophets speaking to Jesus, arriving on the scene. And then in a moment, you hear the voice of God. Saying once again, you had at the beginning of the narrative, this is my son who is beloved. Listen to him. He's well pleased. And now he's saying, listen to him. The voice of God gives us identity when we're discovering our design. And then the voice of God gives us courage as we step into our purpose. God has affirmed Jesus in the past and God is affirming him in this moment. And this is important for the disciples to see, to hear. Again, it's not just Jesus is a preferred teacher. He's not just a successful miracle worker, but no, God is giving the seal, the stamp of approval on the life the ministry, and now the sacrifice that is coming in Jesus's life. He says, this is my son. I want you to listen to them. I want you to listen to him. Excuse me. See, this actually suggests that that Jesus, as he's being transfigured, what we're seeing here is that he is 
sort of bathed in the love of God, bathed in the power of God, bathed in the kingdom of God, so that it's transforming who he is with light. What this says to you and I is as we step into the purpose and the plan that God has for our life, that we too can be clothed, bathed in the light, in the power of God, and also in the kingdom of God. So when we read scriptures like this, where it says we are a city on a hill, or we are a light, that is on a lampstand, that we are to be a beacon of hope. Here's what I'm reminded of when I read this text, that you and I should not be shining our light. We should not be reflecting our our own sort of shine, but there should be the ability for people when they see the glow in us to immediately know that is because they have been with God. They have been in the very presence of God. What a moment for the disciples to see. And Peter, we talked about him a little bit before, but Peter is in this spot and six days earlier, he has this confession. And you remember that the confession of Christ is then followed by a rebuke. He doesn't doesn't understand the way in which Jesus' kingdom looks differently than what he was expecting. Remember, he says, no, I don't don't want you to die, Jesus. I don't like how that sounds. Jesus rebukes him. Well, now you see this moment, Peter is witnessing what he had known would kill him. You see, the way in which they were raised and what they would have known and what they would have heard through story is that you can't go into the presence of God. They knew this based on the way in which the priests operated. They knew this based on, on, on ri- like their, their rituals in their religion. They knew you couldn't be in the presence of God and survive. And Peter is fully aware that what's happening on that mountain, the voice, Elijah, Moses, he knows he is on not just holy ground, but he is on what feels like for him, very shaky ground. Like, am I going to make it out of this alive? And so when we think about that, we read verses five and six a little bit different. Five and six says this, that Peter, he has this, this moment where he says, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let's make three tents. We'll make one for you. We'll make one for Moses. We'll make one for Elijah. Now, I want us to think and consider what he might have been thinking. Let's hold some of this. He says, are are, are the shelters that he's referencing, are these meant to recall the the Exodus and references to the Feast of of Tabernacles in Leviticus chapter 23? Is he basically saying, hey, let's let's go ahead and, and live that out here and now? Are they intended to recall an ancient battle cry? Every man to his tent, oh, Israel is... Is Peter thinking, hey, this is the beginning of the revolution? Jesus called his boys, Moses and Elijah, now we're fixing to get after this thing? You, you can see that in Exodus 25, where, or excuse me, yeah, in 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Chronicles, you have that sort of battle cry. Everybody to their tents, we're about to get after it. Does Peter want to set up some sort of messianic headquarters like here on the mountain? Is this going to be the place in which we sort of make all the calls and and this is like our our central headquarters? Is is, is that in his mind? Maybe, maybe he wants to prolong the blessed moment. Maybe he wants to stay there a little bit longer and then he offers some hospitality so that maybe they're going to stay and be there a, a little bit longer because you can remember throughout the different narratives in the scriptures that when the maybe divine beings would show up, when you would extend hospitality, you would provide them a place maybe to stay, a meal for them. I remember back Abraham and Sarah, that sort of thing, the the divine visitors come and they show hospitality to them. Is Peter thinking, hey, let's, let's, let's set up and let's sort of take care of this moment. Does he, does he think that this is the moment where heaven and, and earth, that they're that they're colliding like the end of, of, of the whole deal. Not, not kind of, does he think like, man, this is where it's all ending right here and I'm, I'm in that moment. Hey, let's, let's sort of stay here. You see, when I, I read the passage and, and we think about Peter, I, I want us to, to catch hold of this. Verse five 
We can wrestle with what are his intentions? What is he meaning? We understand that culturally there would have been a fear, a better word, he, there would have been terror in their heart around being in the presence of God unfiltered. So we know that's coming from the, this sort of space, but maybe there's all these other things sort of swimming around in his mind as well. Here, here are a few things that I want us to grab hold of in this passage. I, I think they're important for us. And the first one, and I hope you'll write this down, is not don't get stuck in the past when God is bringing you into his preferred future. Don't get stuck in the past when God is bringing you into their preferred future. Listen to me. The representation of the old law and the prophets fade away in the light of the new covenant that God is establishing in and through Jesus. So the question for us to ask ourselves is, are we clinging to something that is old when God is desiring to reveal something to us that is new? Catch hold of this. God can be the same that God has always been. And God can also do a new thing. Two things can be right. At the same time, he is the ancient of days. He is the unchanging one, the same yesterday, today, and forever. What that means is God's essence is not changeable, but God's methods and what God is doing in your life and in mine does not have to always look like what he has done methodology-wise. It can be the same essence, but it may not be the same rhythm, and it may not be the same way it happened in the past. Sometimes it is. But I think what ends up happening to us is we lose the tenacity in our faith when we expect God to do the same thing all the time in our life without trusting that there may be some surprises that he has for us, that there also may be some new things that he desires to do. Our God is the ancient one, but he's not stagnant. There's a difference for us, friends. And as we move into who God is and we move into this, this sort of deeper relationship with God, what it requires of us is to trust in the fact that what he has done and what he is doing is rooted in who he is, not the methodology. And the other question we have to ask ourselves connected to this is, are we stuck? Are we stuck in a position, in a way of thinking, in a relationship, in a routine that is keeping us somewhere that God's desiring to move us out of? The old covenant was given to us by God, but the new covenant's better. I don't want to find myself clinging to the thing that is historic and missing the opportunity that God may want to write a new history in me, that God may want to do something fresh and new in and among us. The, the second thing I want us to grab hold of that is on display in this passage, and it's important for us to get, is that you can't stay in the glory moment and avoid the suffering. You see, many of us, we, we, want, we want so desperately our relationship with Jesus to be filled with the glory moments. This narrative is that glory moment. Can you imagine getting invited up to this place with Jesus and that's what you see? You'd have a difficult time explaining that. You'd have a difficult time, but let me tell you what just happened. It's one of the reasons why Jesus says to them, listen, don't even try to explain this to anybody. Don't say anything to anyone. That's a common phrase that Jesus had been saying throughout Mark when he would perform a miracle, when he would set someone free. He'd say, hey, don't say anything. I want you to catch what Jesus says to the disciples. He, he actually gives them a time restraint on that restriction. He says, don't tell anyone until after the resurrection. In other words, the resurrection is going to give you more understanding to what you've just seen because you think this was something. There's a whole bigger deal coming. And the resurrection will help you understand that when you are in the presence of God, it can transform you. And there's an invitation for us to embrace, but what we can't miss, we want the glory moments. We want our life to be filled with those. And God wants those for you. 
Don't hear me saying anything other than that. God wants those for you. But what we see, we never lose sight of. Peter was rebuked for trying to keep Jesus from the cross. He wanted to avoid and wanted Jesus to avoid the pain and the suffering that is found in the cross. And you and I, friends, have to remember this, that the way of Jesus isn't just his miracles and it isn't just his teaching, that there is a painful work in redemption. Friends, redemption is not easy. It's not easy for you and I to be redeemed. Sometimes the redemption not only requires us to embrace the death and resurrection of Jesus, but there are moments and times in our life where the redemption, where God redeeming us will even be painful for us to receive. I'm reminded of what Dallas Willard says when he talks about grace. He says that grace, it's not that it is cheap or that it is free. It may not cost us something, but it is very, very costly. Friend, I want to make sure that we are aware of this rhythm that Jesus models for us. Glory and suffering. That there is this sense where you can be called, anointed, appointed by God. God's favor is upon your life. He has spoken words of affirmation over you. There has been miracles, signs, and wonders following you. And that does not absolve you from seasons and moments of suffering. To see Jesus in all of his glory, we must also see the power that comes in his sufferings. That's precisely what Paul is hitting on later in the New Testament. He says, I want to know Christ, not just an intellectual knowing, but I want to know him experientially as well. I want to know Christ and the power and the fellowship that comes in his suffering. Because there is this sort of rhythm that the glory of God in this moment leads him to a place of suffering, but his suffering then leads him back to a place of glory. There is this sense where not only can we stay rooted in glory, we must be willing to move into the suffering. But friend, let me encourage you with this because if you find yourself in a suffering season, in a season of pain, in a season of loss, in a season of disappointment, in a season of discouragement, let me encourage you that the, those seasons do not last forever. Come on, sorrow may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. The last thing I want you to grab hold of from this passage is this, that you have access to the presence, and I'll even say this, to the glory of God in and through your worship. It's why we begin our gatherings in worship. The people of God, and we've always been a singing people throughout our history, we sing our theology, we sing our praises. But this moment of worship, what worship does for us is it allows us to move our vision, our sight, our understanding, our experience off of this moment. And it returns the gaze back towards God, a God who is able, a God who is worthy, a God who is over and in all things. We return our worship to God. And so here's what happens. We have access to the presence of God, an unfiltered access to the presence of God. We, like the disciples there with Jesus on the mountain, get to hear the voice of God, get to encounter the presence and the overwhelming feeling of God's presence. We get to experience that without a veil, without a proctor. We get to be present. It's good, friends, for us to be in that place. But what we have to do is get our minds set clearly on what God has done and what God is doing through Jesus. You see, worship, friends, is not about how we feel. Worship is not about just soothing an emotion or creating an emotion, but worship is to intentionally and intently get our mind and our hearts focused on what God has and is doing through Jesus. The words that we sing matter. Our heart posture matters because we get a chance in worship to taste and see what God, not just what he's done historically, not what he's doing here and now, but also what is to come. The things that God wants to do in your life in the future, you may begin to get a sense of it in times of worship. 
I'm gonna learn more about what God wants to do in and through me, not by stressing and having anxiety about all the things that I could see, but when I fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith, it is in those moments where I get a sense of what God is doing and what God's pulling me into. Friends, worship is the space where we get to experience the glory of God, the presence of God, even in the midst of our suffering. The powerful word for us is the same thing that we hear God saying over Jesus. The disciples were to receive the word. You and I are to receive that very same word. Listen to Jesus because he is the beloved son of God. What is he saying to us? What is the spirit of Christ saying to you, friend? Are you stuck? Are you in a season that you need to break out of? Are you in a pattern that you need to be broken free and set free from? The powerful language in this passage, this idea of being transfigured, Paul writes to the church in Corinth. He writes to the church in Rome, and he probably has the gospel of mind, uh, gospel of Mark in mind when he talks about using this verb of being transformed. When he says to them, be transformed. Formed, renew your mind. It's the same sort of thing. Don't simply parrot. Don't simply reflect, but be transformed fully and renewed fully. Many of us live our lives with an awareness of Jesus. And friend, I want you to hear this from me so clearly. Jesus is not calling us to know about him. He's calling us to surrender our lives to him. So the question is clear for us. Have we done that? Are we doing that? And the answer to those questions, that is where everything that matters in our life begins. And friends, my prayer is that you will not just consider, but you will make that decision to surrender your life to Jesus, confessing him as Lord, believing in your heart that he is who he says he is, And if he is who he says he is, that means he has done and will do what he said he will do. Your sins are forgiven at a confession and a belief and a surrendering your life to Jesus. And my prayer, friend, is is that you would do that. Grace and peace. We love you so much.